used to always say that on Monday nights. Who used to say that every Monday night? Joe Knight. All right, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this night, and thank you for you bringing these men here. And I just pray, Lord, that you would fill this room with your spirit and your presence, and that you would take your supernatural word, which is flawless, perfect, true, eternal, life-giving, and just let it spread throughout this place and touch us all, our minds and our hearts. And dear God, I pray that it would change us and transform us into the men that you created us to be and that you desire for us to be. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 8. Uh, Steve, that's in the Old Testament. All right, so Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. <laughs> all right, so um, I've entitled tonight's message... All Scripture is God-breathed. And I want to begin tonight by asking you a few questions. Do you trust your Bible? Do you really believe it? I mean, every word in it. Do you, be do you believe that this Bible is, is really and truly the Word of God? I'm going to tell you, from the first moment when I started reading my uh, J.B. Phillips paraphrase. You've heard me mention that before. It was a paraphrase of the New Testament written by J.B. Phillips. And I wish I had my original copy. But um, I, I, the moment I read it, and I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you, the moment I read it, I knew it was true. And I believed it. I came with the faith of a child. But there are many so-called Christians and, and Christian leaders who do not really believe the Bible. They do not believe it is accurate, for example, when it speaks to science and history. You know, the Bible is not a history book, it's not a science book, but when it addresses scientific facts and historical facts, it is true. But many who stand in the pulpit and teach in seminaries believe the Bible is spiritually true, but not factually true. So what do they mean by that? I have no idea. But I know one thing it does mean, they don't really believe the Bible. Dr. Bart Ehrman and by the way, this will be on the radio Saturday and Sunday, so he may, I hope he's listening. And I'll be glad to go have lunch with him. But he's the distinguished professor of religion at UNC Chapel Hill and highly regarded literally worldwide. And he believes that the early writers of the New Testament, I know this because I've read one of, part of one of his books, he believes that they wrote the Gospels in a manner that would actually attract people to Christianity. In other words, the Gospel stories, he believes, were partially made up. The miracles are simply fictional accounts, he believes, to draw people into the faith. Ehrman goes to, on to teach his many students who come from wonderful Christian homes all over North Carolina and all over the country. And they get in his class and he totally confuses them. He teaches his students that there are numerous contradictions and errors in the Bible. So my question to you is who are you going to believe? This redneck from Bethel, or this distinguished professor who I think lives in Chapel Hill? Who are you going to believe? Redneck. Thank you, the redneck. <laughs> Paul writes in um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is what? God breathed. Let me say it again, all scripture was and is breathed out by God. I love that phrase. What do you think this means? I think it means three things. It means, first of all, that the Bible is true. Every word in the Bible flows directly from God. He is the source. He is the creator and the producer of both the Old Testament and the New Testament, down to every single jot and tittle, every single word, every verb tense comes from the heart and mind of God. And the more you study the Bible in the original languages, the more you come to understand it's like the human body. It's, it's got a divine handprint on it. Not only is the Bible true, but the men who penned the scriptures were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That means that, that they were moved to speak and to write exactly as God directed them. This is why Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of men. But men smote, spoke, and I might add they wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Here's what I don't get. If someone believes that God created the world, why is it so difficult for that same person to believe that God 
can also move men to write exactly what he desires for them to write. Which is the greater miracle? All scripture is God breathed. Not only is it true, not only were men carried along by the Holy Spirit, but the Bible contains supernatural power, and because of this, it gives life. It, it truly is life-giving. Now, we don't worship the Bible. We worship the God who wrote the Bible. But the Bible is God's tool to, to chisel away at hard, proud hearts so that we believe. Paul writes in Romans 10, 17, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. Jesus was the living Word, and He's given us the written Word, to guide us to himself so that he might impart to us what? Eternal life. Tonight, what I want to do is I want to give you a very good reason why you can trust your Bible. That is, it, that, you, that you can know that it is the very Word of God. And the reason is what people call fulfilled prophecy. So what is fulfilled prophecy? Well, to prophesy means one of two things. It, it can mean first to forth tell that is to proclaim or preach God's Word, and that's what I'm doing up here. I'm, I'm prophesying. I'm, I'm preaching the Word of God. I'm, I'm foretelling the truth of His Word. At least that's what I'm attempting to do. But it also means to foretell. That is to predict future events. And that's really what the book of Daniel is. It's a book that is, has a lot of foretelling in it. I'm not doing that. I'm not foretelling. There's only one that can do that, and that's God. Fulfilled prophecy is simply the fulfillment of predicted future events by the true prophets of God. Men like Joel and Ezekiel and Micah and, and all those, the 12 minor prophets. They were, they were God's chosen instruments to foretell the future. And the Old Testament is full of prophecies. It's the fulfillment of these prophecies that, that should give us great confidence in our Bibles. Sir Isaac Newton, the English scientist, and theologian and mathematician said prophecy is not given to make men prophets but as a witness to God when it is fulfilled. Amen. One of the strongest arguments for the trustworthiness of the Bible is its 100% accuracy in predicting the future. The Old Testament was written between approximately 1450 and 430 BC and during that time many predictions of future events were recorded in the Bible by God's prophets of the events that were to have taken place by now, every one of them has happened just the way they were predicted. And no other book in the world can make that claim. There's no other book in the world that has one um, pre predictive prophecy that's been fulfilled. Only the Bible. That's why you can put the Bible up against any other religious book in the world. Tonight we're going to read an incredible chapter containing some of the most detailed prophecy in the Bible from Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. I'd like to show you three very detailed prophecies and give you a brief historical fulfillment of each one. And so here's the first prophecy. Prophecy number one concerns the ram with two horns. So I want you to follow along with me. Daniel chapter 8, let's read verses 1 through 4. Daniel writes, In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ule Canal. I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as he charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him, and none could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. Now, Daniel chapter 8 actually comes before Daniel 5 in order, you know, of time sequence. Daniel received this vision in the third year of King Belshazzar. Remember him? He was king when the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians. And here in chapter 8, Daniel finds himself in the citadel of Susa. Susa later became the capital city of Persia, which is modern day, the modern-day country of Iran. And so the, here's the question. Why did God transport Daniel in this vision to Susa, the, the capital city of Persia? You know why? 
It's because God was preparing to show Daniel that the Persian Empire was on the rise. Now, there are two important things that you need to, to make note of in Daniel chapter 8. First, beginning with this chapter, the language switches back to Hebrew from Aramaic. From chapter 2, verse 4, and I don't think I uh, made this point earlier, but from chapter 2, verse 4, through chapter 7, verse 28, the language switched from Hebrew to Aramaic, which was the language of the Gentiles. Because those chapters deal with the four rising Gentile kingdoms. But now here in chapter 8, it switches back to Hebrew. Don't you all find that amazing? Why, so the question is, why does it do that? It's because God was showing Daniel how everything going forward in history would center around who? The Jews. God's chosen people. It's all about Israel. Israel has always been the nerve center of the world. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Israel became the truth center. In the future, when Jesus returns to this earth, it will become the peace center. But for now, Israel is the storm center of the world. So if you want to know what's, what God's doing in the world, just keep your eyes on Israel. Daniel chapters 8 through 12 are going to be dealing with the Jewish people. They will foretell the fall of Jerusalem, the beginning of Gentile domination of Israel, and the changing fortunes of the Jews throughout history. And so from now on, in Daniel chapters 8 through 12, everything is about, everything that Daniel sees, all the visions, he sees in light of its impact on the Jewish people. That's why the language now reverts back to Hebrew. So just remember that, okay? The language switches to Hebrew. But here's the second thing I want you to know. You need to understand the date when Daniel was written. And this is extremely important as the date determines whether or not we're reading history or prophecy. Are you with me? Many liberal theologians believe that Daniel was written in the second century BC, which means that the Babylonian and Persian empires would have already come and gone. But do you know why they say this? It's because they say that Daniel is too accurate. It had to have been written after the fact. So that tells you something about what they believe or what they don't believe. They don't really believe the Bible. That's why I talk about it a lot. I want you to understand that there's a battle out there over truth. And you have to decide whether the Bible is your source of truth or something else. But I decided a long time ago that the Bible is my source of truth. And I'm willing to, I hope, and I think I'm willing to die for it. Dave, uh, Dr. John Wolver, the past chancellor of Dallas Theological Seminary, I'm not even sure if he's still alive today, but he wrote this. He said, Daniel himself may have well lived on to about 530 B.C. And the book of Daniel was probably completed in the last dec decade of his life. He says that with the exception of one person in the third century A.D., no question was raised concerning the traditional 6th century B.C. date until the rise of higher criticism in the 17th century, more than 2,000 years after the book was written. He goes on to say that conservative scholars have given almost universal recognition to the book of Daniel as an authentic 6th century B.C. composition of Daniel, the captive of Nebuchadnezzar. You understand that this higher criticism that began basically in Germany in the 17th century, made its way all throughout Europe, which is why the churches in England and Europe are basically empty. Only about 2% of the people go to church there. What do you think is happening in our country? <laughs> that same higher criticism has found its way back in the 1900s in our seminaries and divinity schools, and it's just sweeping through the land. Are you with me on that? We need to all be aware of that so that we know what's going on. Just for the record, I'm going with all the scholars throughout the centuries who believe Daniel wrote this book while he was still alive. Thus, I believe that all the prophecies in the book of Daniel predate the rise of any of the four empires that we've been discussing. And then verse 1, Daniel tells us that he had another vision. In the vision, he sees a ram with two long horns. One of these horns was longer than the other. That's, a, that's an interesting point there. Why did God put that little tidbit in there? The ram charged toward the west and the north and the south, and no animal could stand against him. He did as he pleased, and he became great. The ram 
I'm going to take you back to Daniel chapters 2 and 7 because they all tie together. This ram is the chest and arms of silver in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Remember back in Daniel chapter 2? And, and it's, this, it's the bear raised up on its side with three ribs in its teeth in Daniel's dream in chapter 7. Who is this ram? It's King Cyrus, the man who conquered Babylon. The two horns represent the Medes and the Persians. But you notice that one grew up later. <laughs> That's because the Medes were more powerful at first, then the Persians became more powerful. And so the longer horn represents the stronger Persians. And from history, we know that the, we know that the Persians charged to the west and the north and the south, taking Libya, then Egypt, and then all of Asia Minor. Now catch this. Centuries before King Cyrus was even born, the prophet Isaiah called him by name as the one who would bring down Babylon and let God's people return to the land of Palestine. In Isaiah chapter 44, beginning looking at verse 28, and then in chapter 45, verses 1 and 4, which guys were written around 700 B.C., this is what the prophet Isaiah, looking into the future, as he was guided along, carried along by the Holy Spirit, he wrote, Cyrus, and again, Cyrus hadn't even born yet. He's looking ahead a couple hundred years. Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and of Israel, my chosen, I summon you, Cyrus, by name, and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I find that just fascinating. Approximately 160 years after Isaiah prophesied this, in the year 539 B.C., Cyrus and his army marched under that city gate through the Euphrates River and took Babylon by storm. And then, even though he did not acknowledge God, he issued a decree for the Jews to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city walls and lay the foundation of the temple. That's what the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are all about. Thus, the 70 years that Jeremiah prophesied that the Jews would be in, the, in Babylon came to an end when, when Cyrus issued that decree and the, the uh, Jews began to return back to their land. You see, men, you can trust the Bible. Why? Because all Scripture is God-breathed. Here's prophecy number two. It concerns the goat with the prominent horn. Look at uh, verses 5 through 8. And as I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. Remember, this is Daniel's dream. So then Daniel says in verse 7, I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off. And in its place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Listen. I'm going to take you through this. There are five historical fulfillments to the prophecies contained in these four verses. First, the goat was Greece. In Nebuchadnezzar's statue, Greece was depicted by the belly and thighs of bronze. And in Daniel's vision, Greece was a swift leopard with four heads. Now, Daniel sees Greece as a goat who runs so fast that his feet never touch what? The ground. Greece became the dominant force in the world faster than any other kingdom before it. And God foretold this some 200 years earlier by the prophet Daniel. The second amazing fulfillment has to do with the reputation of the king. He was Alexander the Great, and Daniel referred to him as a prominent horn. His mother taught him that he was the descendant of Hercules. That is why he was so ambitious. He became one of the greatest and most prominent military leaders the world has ever known. He led the armies of Greece to one victory after another, and they were known for their speed at defeating their enemies. And he extended the Greek empire beyond that of the Persians. The third fulfillment 
has to do with the ruin of the Medo-Persian Empire. God told Daniel that when the prominent horn comes to power, he's going to come against the Persians and the Medes. David Jeremiah writes about this in his book, great book to read on Daniel called Escape the Coming Night. Here's what he says. When Alexander decided to take the Medes and the Persians, he came with 35,000 troops from the west, crossed over the Hellespont, which is the strait that separates Asia Minor from Europe, and he defeated the Persian army. Then he swept on south and took Egypt, Tyre, and Gaza. And then he retraced his steps through Syria and met an enlarged Persian army for the third time. Then he just did just what the scripture said. He threw them to the ground, stomped on them, and the Medo-Persian Empire was wiped out, just as predicted. The fourth remarkable fulfillment in these four verses has to do with the death of the king. God told Daniel that at the height of his power, the horn would be broken off and in its place four prominent horns would grow up. After Alexander conquered the Medo-Persians, he swept on to India, but his tired army had had enough and they returned to Babylon. History tells us that Alexander died at the age of 33, a victim of his own drunkenness and depression, because, as he said, there were no more worlds to conquer. Thus, at the height of his power, Alexander departed from the world. The fifth fulfillment has to do with the four horns that replaced the great horn. When Alexander died, his kingdom was divided, and history tells us that four of his generals took over. And from one of those uh, kingdoms, one of those smaller kingdoms, arose a man who would become one of the most evil rulers the world has ever known. I'll tell you about him in a minute. But here's the big question. What can we learn from all of this? It's great to see the fulfillment of prophecy, and it should give us great confidence in the Bible. But the bigger picture is what was God up to? What was, God, what was going on from God's perspective? Well, remember, one of the great lessons from the book of Daniel is the sovereignty of God. God rules over the affairs of men, and He's moving history according to His will. And God's main de desire is the salvation of the world. And so here's how He used Alexander. You see, Alexander was just a pawn in the hand of God. Alexander was concerned that all the kingdoms he conquered spoke different languages. And so he decided that he would Hellenize the world, which simply means that he would bring all of it under Greek culture. Thus he established the Greek language as the language of the world. He had no idea that he was preparing the way for the Word of God to be communicated to the world. Remember, the New Testament was written in Greek, the very language he forced upon all of his conquered peoples. Furthermore, he built a vast network of highways to connect all the provinces over which he had control. When he moved off the world stage, those roads became the highways and the byways upon which the Apostle Paul traveled to share the gospel to the known world. Do you see how God is at work? Do you see how he uses good kings and bad kings to accomplish his will? You listen, when you, under, when you don't understand what is happening in the world, know this. God is still on the throne. And he's still in charge of history. And I believe we will see a world that's going to become more and more chaotic. That's why we need to become more and more trusting in what God has written in his word. All scripture truly is God breathed. Here's prophecy number three. It concerns the little horn. Look at verses 9 through 12. Out of one of them, that's one of those four horns, came another horn which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens and it threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. It took away the daily sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Because of rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it that is to the little horn. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. At the death of Alexander the Great, as I just said, his empire was divided into four parts among his four generals. And out of one of those horns from the general that actually ruled Syria, 
a little horn appeared on the world stage who became a great leader. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes, the ruler of Syria. He ruled from 175 to 163 B.C. In those 12 years, he became one of the cruelest tyrants the world has ever known. His name actually means Antioch, Antiochus, God manifest. After trying to conquer the world and being stopped by Roman armies, he turned his fury on Jerusalem because he had a, a satanic hatred of the Jews. In the year 168, Antiochus sent an army of 20,000 men to level the city of Jerusalem. They entered the city on the Sabbath, murdered most of the men, and took the women and children as slaves. The remaining men fled to the army of the Jewish leader, Judas Maccabeus. More about him in a minute. But Antiochus wasn't satisfied. He issued an edict that there was to be only one religion, and that religion would be the religion of the Greeks. And so he forbade the observance of the Sabbath and the reading of the Scripture, even burning every copy of the Torah he could find. And if anyone was, man, was caught practicing anything Jewish, that person was executed. David Jeremiah writes, the Jews were forbidden the practice of circumcision. And history records that there were two mothers who, because of their deep commitment to their faith, were determined to circumcise their baby boys. When Antiochus heard about it, he took the babies and killed them, hung them around their mother's neck, and marched the women through the streets of Jerusalem to the highest wall. There the women and their babies were thrown headlong over the precipice. I saw that precipice when I was in Israel. Another story was told of a mother who had seven sons who defied Antiochus. He cut out the boys' tongues in front of their mother and fried them to death on a flat iron, one at a time. Then the mother was murdered. Is it any wonder that the Jews hated this Greek ruler and changed his name to Antiochus Epimenes, which means Antiochus the madman? In Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus mentions the abomination of desolation. He was referring to the moment when Antiochus entered the temple with a pig and slit its throat as a sacrifice on the altar of the Jewish people in the Holy of Holies. And then he took the blood from that pig and spread it all over the inside of the temple, the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant. Then he set himself up to be equal with God. Evil like this is not pleasant to hear about. But I want you to put yourself in Daniel's shoes as he's seeing these visions and dreams pass by his mind. Can you imagine how he must have felt when he realized what was going to happen to his people, the Jews? That's why we're going to see next week in chapter 8, verse 27, that it says that Daniel was exhausted and lay ill for several days. It'd be like if a, a Jewish um, prophet saw a vision of the Holocaust during the 1940s, the fort happened. If you were Daniel and you saw this vision, wouldn't you want to ask God, God, how long will you let this go on? I would. And that's exactly what Daniel did. The answer is provided in verse 14. God told his servant Daniel it would take 2,000 300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. And guess what? This was fulfilled historically for it was about 2,300 days from the time that the Jewish religion came under persecution by Antiochus until the time of his death. You see, God let Daniel know, just as he had Belshazzar, that Antiochus' days were numbered and he brought them to an end. Just for the record, on December 14th, 165, three years after Antiochus desecrated the temple, Judas Maccabeus, it was known as the Maccabean Re Rebellion, Judas Maccabeus and his followers went and rescued Jerusalem. They delivered Jerusalem, and then they purified the temple. And, and when Judas went into the temple, the first thing he, he tried to do was to find oil to which to light the lamps. And according to tradition, the ceremony that would consecrate the temple would take eight days, but there was not enough oil to last eight days. So he took the little bit that he had, and as the story goes, it lasted the entire eight, day, eight days. So today, 
the Jewish people all around the world celebrate what is known as the, the Feast of Reconstruction and Dedication of their Temple. They call it the Feast of Lights or Hanukkah. They're, they're remembering what Judas Maccabeus did in, in getting their temple back. And so on the first day of Hanukkah, devout Jews light a candle. The second day they light another and so on until after eight days there are eight candles burning. It's a sign of victory and deliverance which goes right back to this period in history in the book of Daniel. What's the overarching lesson from these verses? Well, the prophet Isaiah puts it like this. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish the, what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This is why you always hear me praying, Lord, I pray that your word will go forth tonight and accomplish the purpose for which you intend. I can tell you, men, God's purposes are going to be accomplished. God is true to his word. All scriptures God breathe. If God said it, you can what? And as my good friend Ken Smith likes to always say, that's what the book says. And the book don't what? Lie. Lie. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just as there is coming a day when another evil man like Antiochus will arise who will be known as the Antichrist, there is yet an even greater man coming back to this earth. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 1-7 states, Look, He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see Him. Lord, as we wait for Your blessed appearing, Help me and these men to be men of purity, integrity, and passion. In your name I pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming tonight. See you next Tuesday.